Um, let's go ahead and turn to, we're going to read from two passages tonight for our text. And uh, the first one is going to be, uh, let's see, we're going to do Luke chapter 22. Um, turn there with me. Luke 22, and this is the account of the Lord's Supper, beginning in verse 14. It says, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of this fruit or the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which is, or excuse me, which of them it could be who was going to do this. And then the second text we'll read and we're going to get to this in the second half of our study but we'll read it and this is in Matthew chapter 6 because tonight we're going to talk about the last two aspects of Acts chapter 242 which is breaking of bread and prayer so we just read of the Lord's Supper and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6 and let's read what the Lord said to his disciples in this case about prayer Matthew chapter 6 let's go ahead and begin in verse one of this chapter it says beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to see be seen by them for then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven and thus when you give to the needy sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets that they may be praised by others truly i say to you they have received their reward but when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, verse 5, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So those two are going to help us as we're talking through what all of this means. We're going to talk about... Uh, like I said, the, the breaking of bread and prayer. And the title of the message is simply, Break Bread and Pray. It was so simple. There's such simplicity in these two things that I want to make sure that that comes across tonight. The simplicity of it. We'll start with communion. And again, we're going to share communion. So last time we shared communion for the first time, which is a huge thing, which is a huge blessing for me. And for us, I hope that we were able to do that together as a body, as a new local church. But tonight we're going to talk about that again a little bit more in depth. And communion, or the Lord's Supper, was really given to be a simple but beautiful picture of the cross. I think that so often we take, partake in communion and we, we, I don't know, maybe we don't even think of the cross. I hope we do. 
I hope you do. I hope you remember that it's in its essence, that's what it really was all about. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he was specifically saying to remember one aspect. And he was saying, remember my death, proclaim my death and everything that that means. So it's supposed to be, though, a simple but beautiful picture of the cross of Jesus. And it was beautiful because of what it represented. Now, if you took somebody and said, let me show you something really beautiful. And then you took them and showed them a picture of the, the cross of Christ with him on there, beaten and bruised and bloodied. It, you might not convince them right away that this is a beautiful picture. It's not a beautiful movie to watch when you watch The Passion of the Christ. You don't watch it because you want to see something visually beautiful. But you watch it and you can't help but tear up if you're a follower of Christ. Maybe if you're, even if you're not because you have, you're created in the image of God and you can't stand to see somebody go through something like that. But those who know Christ, there's a beauty in it that exceeds anything else in this world because of what it did. What Jesus did on the cross did something that nobody else could do. So it cannot by any means be as beautiful or nothing can be as beautiful as it. It's the only thing, the only way that man could be saved was The Son of God crucified for the sins of His people. That is beautiful. So communion is beautiful because it has us remember the cross. But it was simple. Why was why such a simple thing like we just read in Luke 22? Sitting around a table and sharing a meal. You would think that if it was supposed to be this big grand thing, maybe Jesus would have us do this big elaborate thing. If it meant such something so amazing, why not do this thing that's this big show? Well, some people do that. There are people in this world that take the, 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 the simplicity of communion and it gets surrounded with riches and gold and traditions that, that really just kind of, in my, in my mind, they kind of snuff out the beauty of the cross. The simplicity of these men sitting around a table, probably in a pretty dark room, not a whole lot of money, just bread and wine and fellowship. But I think the simplicity... It was really for the sake of the church. I'm so glad that it's not something huge and elaborate that I have to go through to remember the the cross. But we were given something simple like this. We need simplicity in our lives. I think you would agree. The simplicity of of this, this act of breaking bread. Think of the two elements that Jesus gave for us to remember His death by. Bread and wine. Nothing really spectacular about those two things. Although we might now think of them as spectacular because in their simplicity, now we recognize them as amazing. The the elements, they they speak so beautifully of what Jesus did. And so they become the simplicity and what we are given to do as an act of obedience. And Jesus did say, do this. So every Christian, and I emphasized that last week, non-believers, and this isn't a a dog on any non-believer. This is is for the safety of non-believers. If you're not a Christian, don't take communion. The Bible says, if you do, if you take this in an unworthy manner, you're heap, you are guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So it would be, it's, it's better for a preacher to stand and say, if you're not a Christian in this room, wherever that would be, I beg you, don't take communion. It doesn't make sense, but every believer is commanded by the Lord Jesus to do this in remembrance of of Him. What's so amazing about communion, though, is it's a, it preaches the gospel, the communion itself. So at any point, at any time, the gospel can be preached, proclaimed, and heard, and someone can come to recognize the body and blood of Jesus being the only way to salvation. And then, as a believer, as a disciple of Christ, they then, out of obedience to the Lord, can partake in communion. So Acts 2.42, which is why we took this break, was because it, it really paused us here with these four pillars of the church, which was the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and then tonight, the breaking of bread and prayer. Acts 2.42 tells us that the early church was devoted to the breaking of bread. Uh, think about the simplicity we just mentioned and then being devoted to such simplicity. Devoted to something like communion. What did that look like? And the question would be, what should that look like today? So what should that look like for us as New City Church is getting a foundation and we're we're growing and there's things happening in each of our lives. What should that look like in our church? Or should it look the same way as this at all? Are we supposed to model the New Testament church as we see in the book of Acts? Is it just as important for the 21st century follower of Jesus to take part in the Lord's Supper 
Meaning, what, is it so important that I would say, if you're a Christian, you must be taking the Lord's Supper? You actually must be devoted to it. So we, we just covered the, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and we kind of come through that and go, yes, we should be devoted to those things. Breaking of bread. Are we devoted to the breaking of bread? And then all that it represents. And so Luke 22 really gives us an account of this Last Supper at the Passover meal just before Jesus' death. We reference that because that's where the Lord first... That wasn't, that wasn't His first Passover meal, right? Passover's been done for, eight, for, for thousands of years, hundreds of years. And here Jesus is sharing this Passover meal, but it becomes something so, so much more significant. In that text that we read in Luke 22, it says that Jesus desired eagerly to share this meal with him. Did you guys notice that? It said, Jesus desired eagerly to share this meal. Why do you think the Lord desired so much to eat this Passover with them? Knowing in our minds that he had eaten so many Passover meals throughout his entire life. Remember, he's a Jewish, he was, he was a Jew. So he, he ate Passover. He traveled to Jerusalem with his family for Passover. And here he is with his disciples at the Passover and he's eating this meal. And what is so significant about it? Why would he be so eager to eat this meal with him? And I think it's because he was about to die. Just think about that. That makes everything significant. We've, we've been asked those questions. So, what would your last meal be if you were about to die? You know, you ever, like the, I think I always come up short on that one. You answer it first and you go, wait a minute, no, there's a better meal than that. This was bread and wine. Think about this. This was the last meal he chose. Why would he be so eager just before he died to share this meal with them? And it's because of his death. This would be the last one with his disciples. And why is that significant? It's because this very meal of bread and wine, broken bread, and as we're going to get into those, I think there's something in talking about what those elements mean. Broken bread and then simply juice pressed out from grapes representing to us the suffering that Jesus would endure just a few hours later. The broken bread and the wine. So, a couple hour, a few hours from this moment as we read this text, Jesus would then step in and do the very thing that these elements represented. Jesus was instilling into these disciples the true meaning of the Passover what that looked like for the Jews as they remembered to, to sacrifice the lamb and to do these, have this meal, right? And sacrifice one lamb per household and then take the, the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the doorposts of the house. And then in doing that, the, the, the dark angel, the death angel would pass over those houses and the, the, the firstborn of that house would be spared. It would be spared. And so Jesus is telling them though, ultimately in this, what did this really mean? He was about to be broken and poured out for sin. And truly, as he's sharing this last meal that represents this act that he was going to do, he is also saying that one one day we will share this meal again in his presence. And think about what that would have been like to hear. I'm not going to do this again until later. There was a later coming. And we can look forward to that every time we share communion together. Looking forward to the fact that this meal that we share in its simplicity, one day we will be around a table with Christ Himself. We will see Him. And we will know Him. So then Jesus explained the elements in our text as we will do each time we share our meal with each other here as we share this particular meal as a church body. And so let me just, I'm going to share some, uh, some key points with you and then we'll move on um, in a moment to prayer. Here's what I want us to remember from the Scriptures when we think about being devoted to the breaking of bread. Because I want it to be practical here. If we're supposed to devote to it, then I really think we should know what that means. So when we devote to the breaking of bread, we're devoting to the breaking of bread because Jesus told us to do it. Right? And I think, so for some of us, we'd say, well, that's enough. Uh, if Jesus says do it, I'll do it. Some, for some of us, Jesus has stolen our hearts so much, has won us over so much that we'll do whatever He says. Others, perhaps in this room or other places, they need more qualifiers. I'm not going to do it just because Jesus said to. What does this mean? So there's skeptics among us. There's some that are have different... We're all given a measure of faith, and that's okay. 
But that is a reason. That is a reason. We're devoting to this. The disciples devoted to this because they sat around the table and Jesus says, do this. And then they witnessed him. They witnessed the murder of Christ. They witnessed his resurrection. And so they do this. And so if someone thinks that this may not apply to us today because we're not those early disciples, the only thing we have to look to to then take this command of Jesus around the table and then say, yes, we still do this today, is the Great Commission. Jesus said to those very 12, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And that was including this. The Last Supper, every teaching, everything that Christ did, He then transferred through His disciples and said, go make disciples. A disciple is someone who takes the words of Christ, the, the teachings of Christ, all that He ever said and did, which was exalt God, exalt the entire Scriptures, Old and New Testament. He gave the authority of the church to then go and carry on a new covenant. And Jesus says, go and a disciple is one who goes and teaches them to observe all those things. So, practicing communion or sharing in this meal, being devoted to it is for us today too. Secondly, in devoting to the breaking of bread, guys, we're devoting to the gospel. Now, it's because we know what these represent. Somebody that comes into a room with believers and maybe they're a non-believer and they share a meal like this and they share in the communion meal, it does not mean they necessarily know the gospel but this is what makes it meaningful to a believer to a christian a disciple of christ because in devoting to the breaking of bread and what they mean and what the bread and the wine meant we're devoting to the gospel and so let me give you four sub points that help us to really see so that every time we have this opportunity to share communion together you're able to reference these things and know that we're really we're remembering the gospel and it's this, the first is that in the breaking, or excuse me, in the broken bread, we see Christ's substitution for a people broken from sin. When we see the broken bread, and we go back to that table each time, and we see the different pieces of one bread, we're to remember that we didn't always have restored relationship with either God or with humanity. That through Christ, though, the body of Christ is formed, right? That He becomes our substitution for a people that were broken because of sin. He stepped in and substituted for us. So we should remember that. In the breaking bread, in the broken bread, we see Christ's substitution for a people broken from sin. Secondly, in the sharing of broken bread, we see Christ's separation from the Father at the cross. And then what that represented in Him doing that is our wholeness as a family through the work of the cross. So what is the beauty of a church, a local church, sharing communion together? Why is it so important? Because we're remembering the work that God does to make a family out of people who really otherwise would not have a whole lot in common. Maybe some. But Christ joins us together. Joins us together. And you know what? I didn't even realize this. Maybe some of you knew this, but today is World Communion Day. Did you guys know that? Like, I don't even know who made this up, but I started seeing these things on Facebook. And it's and so people all over the globe right now, well, not right now, we have a church at a weird time, uh, you know, there, but there's, there's this recognition in that alone that through the blood, through the blood of Christ and the breaking of his bread and his body, what's united is a family all around the globe. We are one with the body of Christ, with, with believers everywhere all over this earth. And that's pretty significant. Jesus was separated from the Father at the cross because in that moment He became sin for us. That's what the Scripture says. And because He was separated from the Father, through our faith in Him, we're justified and we don't have to be separated from the Father. Thirdly, in the wine, now moving on to the wine, in the wine we see the pressing and the anguish of Jesus in the events of the cross. So when we think about the juice that is so conveniently packaged in a Welch's you know, container for us, try to remember back to the grape <laughs> that produced that juice. There was a pressing, there was an actual thing that took place. So in the same way, we're to remember that Christ was... He went through such anguish and agony and He Himself was pressed. And so when we look at the wine, we remember that. In the wine, we see the pressing and anguish of Jesus in the events of the cross and the blood that flowed down the cross. 
And then the last in the drink that we share as we partake of that together. And we do this here a little bit differently. We'll just dip the, the cracker in there and that's okay. There's juice there. But in that sharing of the, of the, the element of the, of the drink together, we acknowledge that we are a body of people forgiven and covered in Christ's atoning sacrifice. As a church, guys, if we're going to be serious about this, according to the Scriptures, we're devoting to a life of regular heart examination and repentance from sin. That's the hardest part, I think, about communion. And it's the most serious. And I don't want to ever forget that. I don't want that to be something that we as a church, we come in here and just kind of relaxed about it, but that there's an, area, an element of, of seriousness taking joy in what the elements represent and being you know, worshipful in that act and understanding what Christ did for us. But man, the Scriptures, and we're going to look at it again in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17 through 31. We, we covered that last week. Turn with me there briefly. This is 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, and then beginning in verse 27, specifically this is what I want us to notice again. The Apostle Paul says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. And so let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So we need to be a people that are devoted to this too. If we're going to truly follow and look at this, these pillars as what upheld the church, then we're going to know that what we're really devoting to, what we are willing to be devoted to then is to a life of examining ourselves examining ourselves before the Lord. And then if we see if, if the Lord points out anything that is not right in us, we're, we are going to come in repentance before the Lord and simply say, I'm going to turn from that. Lord, I'm, I'm turning from that. By your help and by your Holy Spirit and by your power, I'm going to turn from that. We don't want to come into remembering the cross of Christ while we are willingly and openly committing sin in the middle of a life that is consciously rebellious against God and then sharing in the elements that represent the very act that died for those things. But, but instead, coming to that place and, and, and saying, Lord, what is if there's anything in me that is not right with you and I'm about to remember the cross, then Lord, help me to repent of those things because the cross itself gives us that, the power. to re- Because of the cross, we then have the power to repent. Jesus was victorious over sin. And so we can come to the table. We can repent and be forgiven of our sins and know forgiveness and know it. Not have to come as condemned people, but it is a place of examination. And so Paul made that clear. And we need to be people who are devoted to the gospel. And a person that is devoted to the gospel is a person who has been forgiven of all guilt. That's amazing. To know that we can come to the table being forgiven, knowing we're forgiven, of all guilt. We're called to examine our hearts regularly at the table and proclaim the death of Christ that ultimately killed the bondage of sin. The death of Christ killed the bondage of sin and gives eternal life to those who believe. And so what is an examination of the heart really? And ultimately what that is is prayer. And so we're going to use that to go into our next portion of this, which is prayer. When you come before the Lord in communion, or at any setting, and we begin to examine our hearts, or you're praying in your closet. You notice how it said in our text in Matthew 6, when you pray, don't pray openly. That doesn't mean that we can't do corporate prayer, because that's in the New Testament. This is talking about not praying corporately and openly for the sake of being heard by others. But really, we understand something about the heart of God, or the character of God, in His statement saying, go into your closet and pray, and the Lord who hears you in secret. What does that tell us about God? It tells us of His omniscience, His omnipresence, His power, that He hears us when we pray. Even if you were to go into your closet, do you believe that in the darkness of your room by yourself, 
that you could utter words and God would hear you because you're his child. That he would hear you, he would listen, to, and you would not have a turned ear because the dark, you know, the lights are off and not everybody else is listening. But in fact, that is honoring to God for us to know when we're by ourselves and we're alone, he hears us in secret and he will reward us openly. He hears us. But that's ultimately what we're doing in the examination of our own hearts is we're praying. And so let me answer this question as best as I can. I'm going to use a little help from my buddy Charles Spurgeon. If you guys don't know who he is, I will probably talk about him quite a bit. Not more than Christ, but Charles Spurgeon, is. Uh, I'm a pretty big fan of his. But what is prayer? And he gives this definition. Prayer is the lisping of the believing infant, the shout of the fighting believer, and the requiem of the dying saint falling asleep in Jesus. Think about the simplicity first of that first part of it. Prayer is the lisping of the believing infant. That means you could be the most in your most infant stages of life with Christ and barely know how to speak, but God wants you to speak to Him. We think about a parent that that somehow (laughs) is able to interpret their child's language. (laughs) Goo-goos and and you're like, oh, (laughs) you know, and everybody's going, what did he say? It's this, think about it. Think about how God, though, with, with a person who's so in their infant stages of, of faith, God wants the infant Christian to pray, knowing that God will hear him. And then, and then the second part is the shout of the fighting Christian, the fighting believer. That's prayer, too. So we get to this point, believers get to the point where they're no longer infants, but they move, they're moving on and they're growing and they're maturing, and it becomes a fight. You pray every day because you know if you don't, you're going to fail in sin. If you don't fight and stay connected to the vine and you don't fight to to be filled with the spirit and to fight against sin then you will sin and you will fall and so we're fighting it's the it's the shout of the the fighting believer and it's the requiem of the dying saint falling asleep in jesus and so all the way to the very end of our lives we're to be communicating with god praying seeking the lord talking with him jesus taught these men that we're speaking of the same men that were around this table taught them to pray. Also, Jesus prayed all the time. You'd have a hard time thinking that Jesus didn't believe in prayer. Just reading through the Gospels, we see Jesus in in times of, of struggle and times where it was a little bit peculiar that he stepped away to pray. Jesus would step away to pray when things were really busy. When things are really busy for us, we probably stop praying and we try to get busy, taking care of business, doing things, right? Jesus would step away from crowds and be alone with His Father and pray. Prayer is regular and sincere communion with the Father. And I want to say this, it's not about eloquence, it's about access, right? We pray, we can pray because we have access to God through Christ. So a lot of people struggle with prayer just because they say, oh, well, I don't know how. And it's like this open, usually it's the praying around people that's an issue. But Jesus taught us to pray. And so Christians, disciples, should be also open to teaching others how to pray. If somebody's got a hard time praying, then, then teach them. Isn't that amazing? We forget that we can teach people to pray. And we need to be teaching younger believers to pray. So as we begin to interact with new believers and believe, people come into our midst or into your life, This needs to be part of it. Teaching people to pray. Being devoted to prayer. It's a regular and sincere communion with the Father. Who has access to the Father in prayer? Just think about that for a moment. Who has access? Now, the answer is kind of hidden in the question in that word Father. I kind of gave it away. Who has access to the Father in prayer? And according to the Scriptures, those who have access to the Father are His children. His children. And we've talked about this before, and this is a hard thing, a hard pill for many in this world to swallow, but not everybody in this world is a child of God, according to the Bible. Not according to my words, but according to the Bible. According to the Bible, the entirety of creation is born in sin, and actually the Scripture says is because of that sin, we are separated from God. Sin separates us from God, which Adam and Eve had this beautiful relationship with God in the garden. They were his kids, his very first, right? As far as on this earth. When they sinned, that was broken. That's clear in the Bible. Sin caused us to fall 
so deep, so depraved that there is no relationship with God for a person that is born into this world. There is no relationship like that. Father, child, no loving relationship. And it's not because of, it's, it's because of sin. Sin separated us, separates us from God. So then a child of God then is, the scripture teaches, is one who comes to God through faith in his only begotten son. Who through faith in Christ, who came and then became the sacrifice for that sin. Our faith in him causes us to then be born again, believers, children of God. Only through Jesus Christ. So his children have access. Those whose faith is in the sacrifice of Christ is, are the ones that are the children of God. And so there's so much to say about prayer. Like I'm not telling you that today's study in prayer is going to co- cover it all. We could spend a year teaching on the subject and, and we, it might not even make us better at praying. You could pray and you could do a study on prayer and read devotionals on prayer and oftentimes it's, it's still the one thing that people come in readily saying, I don't pray enough. I, I'm not very good at praying. I know I need to pray more. I don't know anybody that ever, I've ever heard say they've reached their goal in prayer. I'm praying enough. It's, I've never heard that. Even in the guy, in people that I look up to, that I know pray better than I do and more than I do and are more faithful in it, they are still, somehow, for some reason, they're still humble in it and God humbles them and says, you need to be talking to me more. There's something about that. As we mature in Christ, God reveals in us deeper issues that we just know we need Christ more. So it's going to take more than just a study. It's going to take more than those things. It's going to come down to more than just knowledge. If we're going to be devoted to prayer, then we're going to, each of us, need to believe that God is who He said He is. If we are going to be devoted to God in prayer, then we need to know who God is, who He said He is. And He's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. These are important things to know when we go to Him in prayer. He's perfect. He makes no mistakes. He has no needs. You know what's interesting about children coming to their parents to fulfill their needs is that we have our own needs, right? A child comes to us and we might not be able to help them. There are certain things that my kids may request that I can't give them. You know, that there's nothing that you need, nothing that I need that Christ, that God does not have enough of to supply you. And that's the most, that's one of the most amazing things about prayer is this, it's this deep well that never runs dry because God has no end. And if we're His children and we're coming to Him through faith and we believe in who He, who he says He is, then we're going believing that He is not going to run out of what we need. He's all powerful and He's all knowing. He sees everything in my heart. He sees everything in your heart. He knows my next breath and my next thought, and the same with you. He knows what you need before you even think it. And all of this is exactly what Jesus taught His disciples when He said, or excuse me, when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And when we read Matthew 6, and He went through that prayer that we probably all memorized as a kid, our Father who art in heaven, notice the reference to the Father. And His place, where He is, His authority. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or holy be Your name. We're acknowledging in that prayer, Jesus taught us to pray in a way where we acknowledge Jesus as the Holy One. The One who is set apart from all other beings. He is holy. He is perfect. He is set apart. Give us this day our daily bread, He said. And so then we understand provision. We understand we're going to Him for the things that we need. And so I would encourage you to go back through Matthew chapter 6 on your own time, read through that, and maybe if you've never seen that as really more of an outline or an encouragement for you to pray like this and not necessarily pray this, but the Scriptures do give us an outline to pray. Jesus said, pray like this. And so I would encourage you to take every time for the, for the next few weeks, and when you go to pray, or when you run out of things to pray, turn to Matthew 6, look through that, and pray through the lens of what Jesus said to His disciples. Take the words of Christ when He taught His disciples to pray, and let God transform your prayer life through those words. 
Spurgeon also said, prayer is not meant for the Lord's information. The question is not put to you that you may instruct him, but that he may instruct you. And I think we often we go to this, you know, I think we need to be trained in this. We go to the Lord and we and we just give him a bunch of information like, Lord. You know what's going on today. Today I had, um, you know, I had a hard morning and and, uh, you know, I had breakfast and, you know, you, you, we don't we're not we're not giving God info. And so if we could just change that to say, prayer then for us is that we know we need from God. We know we need Him. We're going to, we're going to Him in prayer, not because we're coming to supply the Lord's informa- with information, but because we need Him to instruct us. We want Him to instruct us. God, whatever you say, I'll do it. I believe that when you go to God in prayer and you, and you, and you let your life be transformed, your prayer life transformed according to these words, according to Matthew chapter 6, and you go to God as holy, supreme being, and He's the one who supplies you with daily bread. And He's the one who can keep you from sin and from temptation. And He's the one whose kingdom is eternal and His kingdom is coming. That if we do that, I think God will transform your, your life through that. And so the challenge, or excuse me, the encouragement is to be a church and a people devoted to prayer, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Not so that we would get what we want, right? We don't want to be a church devoted to prayer because we have this big, all these things that we want, but that God would give us what we need. And what do we need more than anything? His presence. We need His presence. We should want His presence. And there's something about gathering as a church, as a local church, and being devoted to prayer and the breaking of bread. And so just for a moment, I want to speak about that presence. In case there's anyone in this room or anyone that would listen at any other point in time that cannot say with assurance that they belong to Christ. So you, I think we can acknowledge that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, these really are, this is kind of an instruction for a church, right? We're looking at Acts 2, 42, these pillars of the church. So I've been speaking to the church mostly about these devotions, a, a, a believer. But do you know that when it comes to devotion, there's no one more devoted than God is. God is the most devoted being in the universe. And if we could wrap our, hand, our heads a little bit around what God has determined to devote himself to, we're going to come, again, come up against some pretty strong truths, gospel truths. And I'm talking about his devotion to the salvation of his people, his devotion to saving souls. The Holy Spirit's relentless devotion to go after lost sheep. That's what He does. The Holy Spirit goes. He goes to the hearts of those who have yet to submit to Christ and He tugs at people's hearts and He points people to the Gospel. He reveals sin and reveals that judgment comes to sinners who are outside of Christ. And then He tells, He preaches. The Holy Spirit is a preacher. Better preacher than me, than anybody. He preaches to the heart directly. The Holy Spirit's relentless devotion to go after lost sheep and regenerate hearts. What does the Holy Spirit do when He regenerates a heart? We're regenerated from loving sin and loving self. Those two things are so evident in this world. Loving sin, meaning it's not quite understood or grasped in everybody's mind that sin will destroy, right? And so you look at a world, and I'm, I'm, the categories, they're endless. You just try to define what is sin or what's sinful behavior, and it's, it abounds in this world. And you, you can't just go to somebody and convince them to stop sinning because sin is pleasurable. Sin appeals to the flesh of man because we are fallen, sinful creatures. But when the Holy Spirit comes to regenerate a heart, that person stops loving sin and stops loving self and ultimately comes to love God who hates sin. Comes to love God who sent His Son to die 
for the sins that we commit every day and that we've committed for a lifetime. And not only that, the sin that we were born into. We were born in sin. We were all born separated from God because of the original sin of our parents, Adam and Eve. And so the Holy Spirit, though, can regenerate and wakes a heart up to not love sin and self, but to love God. And then the devotion of Jesus. Think of the devotion of Jesus himself to go to the cross and bear the sins of the world on his shoulders. That is devotion. To go up a hill with a cross on your shoulders, knowing, first of all, full well what this was going to mean. He knew that at the top of that hill, he would then bear the weight of the world's sin. He would be crushed. What had just happened was nothing. He had already been beaten and whipped 39 times. He had already, he had already been mocked, beard ripped out. The, the humiliation alone would have crushed most of us just being humiliated, teased. But all that he had gone through was nothing compared to what was going to happen on that hill when he would li- be lifted up on the cross and then bear the sins of the human race. And ultimately, it wasn't even necessarily bearing the sin that was the hardest part, but it was that his father was going to judge him for that sin. And he was devoted to that. He devoted himself to that. Hebrews tells us that he did that. The book of Hebrews says that he endured the cross, that he despised the shame. And he did it for us. He did it for the glory of the Father. So we need to consider that. The devotion of Jesus to go to the cross to bear the sins of the world on His shoulders. His devotion to obey the will of the Father and then absorb. Guys, I think that word does something to me to help clarify the Gospel a little bit more. What what Jesus did on the cross in absorbing the wrath that we deserved. Think of it. He absorbed it. He took it all. So a believer no longer worries about the wrath of God. A disciple of Jesus Christ is the only person who can live this entire life, their entire life, and not worry a bit about the wrath of God. Not worry a bit about being judged for their sin when they stand before God. Because if Jesus is your substitute, if he substituted for you and took your place on the cross, he absorbed all the wrath. He absorbed it all. And I want you to just just think about that for a moment. There's nobody else who did that. Nobody else absorbed the wrath of God for you and me. Only Jesus did. And so think of his devotion and think of it how it was for you. That he was devoted to that so that you would be saved. So that you and I could be made right with him. God, can I say this, is above all other things that he's devoted to. And the scriptures, I believe, take, uh, they go to great lengths to prove this. Is that God is devoted to his own glory. God is devoted to His own glory. You could, you could sum up everything in what God does in that it glorifies Him, right? What God does, what He decides to do, He wouldn't do it if it didn't glorify Him. And it brings Him great glory to save sinners. That's where I want you to think tonight. I don't want you to think of all those other things that are still a little bit confusing and hard to reconcile, but think about this one thing that sinners who sinned against Him gravely and deserved His judgment... It glorifies Him to save sinners. It glorifies Him to save sinners whom He has predestined for Himself. What that means is that He, though we have sinned, we are sinful, broken creatures, He has predestined to save people for Himself. That means an eternal God from eternity past looked to the future and saw you, right? knew you, and he had predestined to save a people for himself, to free men and women from slavery to sin, from slavery to their sin when they believe and receive the gift of eternal life. And so I I hope, and maybe, you know, if this is every one of you, then, then great. Then fall in love with Jesus again today with his gospel and what he did for you. And I hope you all believe this today. And if you don't, then really, I, then I'm, I am calling for a response, right? There should be a response in every single one of us according to this text. 
we should all re- we should I know I my response to this is is thankfulness and repentance. You know, how could I leave this place and continue in any sin? No, I'm not telling you I'm going to leave here perfect because I just preached this message. No, but how can we leave this place knowing the the devotion of our God to us without some sort of response? And so the response is not because I'm telling you to respond, but because God would have you respond. God gives faith. And so what I would say is, um, is let the Lord challenge you tonight. Maybe you've never made a deep, deep decision to, to then, so that Christ would be everything to you. That everything that He did was, was exactly what you needed Him to do. And there's nothing more that can be done or needs to be done to save you or to secure you or for you to be forgiven of all sin. There's nothing more that can be done. It's only Jesus. So commit to that. Believe in that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take communion together. And the way we set it up is there's a uh, in the there's a table back there. The first one back there will just remove the paper towel from the top and there's just pieces of unleavened bread and then a little cup of juice and so as i'm playing this last song um as i'm playing the song you guys can feel free nobody is obligated to as i said from the scriptures believers are are free to do this if you're not a believer in christ i I would encourage you just to sit in your seat and and examine that but but you can be right with the lord in a moment right anybody can in a, in a moment, God can awaken your heart and bring about faith in Christ so that you are so you are no longer held guilty or condemned for your sins because all that's been absorbed by Christ. So I'll, I'll play this song, and then after you guys come back to your seats with those elements, then I will pray, and we will receive communion together.